Tanya was able to join us. Um, you know, everyone, but really in, in particular, because she's been doing a lot of um, these kind of presentations. And you know, I just think what she has to say is super important for a provider standpoint. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Medania, for um, no my request. <laughs> and thank yeah. you, everybody, everyone that's on this. But really, um, I appreciate you all. And I appreciate everyone who's attending. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Formally, hello to everyone. My name is Stacy Ledbetter, again, one of your moderators for this evening, and my partner may be with us shortly, uh, Dr. Luchara Wallace. For those of you who have been attending, she's been our regular moderator, and so there's nothing wrong with uh, teamwork making this dream work. So that's what we're going to do. I just want to uh, acknowledge all of our sponsors after I do this title for this week or this month is Community Conversations, Gun Violence Solutions, uh, with a subtitle of Community Conversations on Trauma and Ending Gun Violence in Our Community. And obviously that's a very uh, strong statement, but we're gonna do our best to talk about it and lift up whatever we can so we can eventually, on a daily and on a continuum, not just in this space for a couple hours, uh, do our best to do that for our, our community. And hopefully it could spread far and, and wide. So I just want to lift the names. We have many people who have so much value to add to this conversation. And also want to encourage everybody in attendance in general, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, please utilize the chat. And we'll do our best to incorporate as much as we can, because it's probably a lot more uh, personal experience in this space than we even realize, but who you will be hearing from formally this evening um, in no particular order. Uh, Tamara T.C. Custard, CEO of Village in the Valley. And Ms. Custard, I definitely hope, I'm used to calling you T.C., so I hope I said your first name correctly, so please uh, correct that when we get to you. Uh, Director Victor Ledbetter of the Kalamazoo Valley Community College Police Academy. Dr. Sandra Medania of the Bronson Healthcare Group. Tammy Ray, the new Kalamazoo County Commissioner of District One. Vice Mayor of the City of Kalamazoo, Patrice Griffin. Dr. Cheryl Dixon, who you have already heard from. She usually likes to be in the background, but she has so much to offer. So we're gonna be tugging on her as well. Our Associate Dean at the WMU Medical Schools, specifically Health, Equity and Community Affairs. We have Ms. Stephanie Moore, former Kalamazoo County Commissioner for District One, but a pioneer in her own right. She was the first black female county chairwoman. Um, and so proud of that. And she's currently with Mothers of Hope. And then we have Miss Gwendolyn Hooker. She's executive director of Hope Through Navigation. So as stated, they all definitely um, are gonna have some wonderful input for you tonight. But acknowledge on our committee, I mentioned to you that Candace Morris Tech, I see Andrew, he's one of our committee members. We meet just to pull together uh, subject matter for you all, if you will, um, so we can bring forth things that are very relevant, things that we can all learn more about and just share experiences and do better collectively as a community. So we love the intersection. And with that, our sponsors, Everywhere that I uh, named that these individuals are from. So the city of Kalamazoo, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, Kalamazoo, specifically the law design team, Black and Blue Networking and Consulting, LLC, Mothers of Hope, the Lewis Walker Institute at Western Michigan University, Bronson, Village in the Valley, uh, Kid Network, and hope through navigation. So with that, I will uh, jump right into it and we'll start calling on our panelists to introduce yourself, but just even with that tie in a synopsis, if you will, just even related to our title, those gun violence solutions, these community conversations related to trauma and ending gun violence. So just taking a, a few minutes in terms of explaining um, your lane in this, if you will, your vantage point, your path, your experience that you're gonna focus on this uh, afternoon and evening for everyone in this space. And how about we start with TC Custard, if, um, if you're ready to roll to talk to us. I can be ready to roll. Hello, yes, I am TC Custard, uh, Tamara, 
is my full name, but TC preferably. Uh, I am representing Village in the Valley as well as just a resident and activist in the community. Um, I have joined uh, quite a few initiatives and I have been working close with Gwendolyn uh, recently with gathering data and statistics and trying oh. to get in comparison between our data as well as KDPS's. So I'm not sure exactly where you would want me to start with this, Stacy. Well, that was wonderful, given the advantage, what you do, what your organization does. And so that was a wonderful start. So they could just hear your voice, folks trying to kind of get their placement. If you all don't have it on speaker view, so you're capturing the person who's speaking at the time, you know, becomes that big picture for you. This will give everyone an opportunity to get their tech together just as well. So why don't we go to uh, Victor Ledbetter next, just a brief intro on what you do uh, with your organization. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Vic Ledbetter. I retired from Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety after 25 years. I retired in 2017. For the last four years of my career, I was the captain of the detective division. So I had a whole slew of cases involving gun related um, incidents. And I have quite a few stories to share with you from my perspective of um, some of the issues that I see and hope that we need to um, mitigate in order to be successful in solving these shootings. So I have skin in the game. I still have a lot of family, friends in Kalamazoo. And of course, um, it affects us. If you know someone who lost someone to gun violence, we all are affected. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, Dr. Medania, please. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you. Um, okay, hey, my name is, thank you. My name is Sandra Medania. I am a trauma surgeon at Bronson Methodist Hospital in uh, Kalamazoo. I uh, trained in uh, North Philadelphia Temple University Hospital and did my fellowship at uh, the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center. Uh, I came to medicine via a sociology degree actually. Didn't think I wanted to go to medical school. Um, and ended up going, uh, getting my master's in public health where I realized that there was a connection between health and human rights. And that, uh, you know, what, what I saw during my medical clerkship was that I wanted to affect change and I wanted the immediacy. So, you know, initially I went in thinking I'd do primary care, but uh, realized that surgery was, was calling me. And um, trauma surgeons see a range of, um, pathologies, obviously, but um, those of our community that are most at risk for um, uh, racial injustice, um, discrimination, um, violence, um, and poverty, uh, they are affected by trauma um, in, a great, in a greater way. So um, that is where I, I wanna lend my voice, not only to um, heal people, but also to advocate on their behalf and um, and just witness, be a witness to what I'm seeing in my emergency room and in my ICU and, and try to help my patients to, to heal. Thank you so much, Dr. Medania. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Commissioner Tammy Ray. Good evening. Um, as Stacy said, my name is Tammy Ray, um, County County Commissioner elect. Madam Commissioner Stephanie Moore still holds the title. Um, until January. Um, I'm also one of Isaac's co-chairs for the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, along with Rick, who was also on the call. Um, I'm a Northside resident, also directly impacted by gun violence. Um, just working with com other community leaders and community members to talk about solutions to the gun violence in our communities. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Stacey. Wonderful, thank you. We're glad to have you. And actually I'll go to uh, Commissioner more next and Steph, I wanna apologize. I was on your last meeting and I heard all y'all saying goodbyes. And so I thought the transition was here. So Commissioner Moore, go ahead and go next. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Stephanie Williams, uh, currently serve on the Council County Commission, District One. Um, yes, Stacey, you probably heard me saying goodbye. I checked out a while ago <laughs> and I'm running like a runaway slave. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident 
of Kalamazoo uh, have served in elected office for the last 15 years, uh, also on the city commission as well. A proud resident of the North Side. I love where I live. I'm absolutely impacted by gun violence every single day. We have shots, numerous shots fired every single day. Uh, and typically uh, no less than two to three blocks from my home uh, where I raise my children and my grandchildren. I'm very passionate about this issue. I do believe that it is a public health crisis and we should address it from that such, but we will talk a little bit more about that going into this. But um, other than that, uh, I'm happy to be here with all of you today. And thank you to Dr. Cheryl Dixon uh, for bringing us all together on such a very important topic. Absolutely. And let, next let's have um, the executive director of Hope Through Navigation talk to us, Ms. Gwendolyn Hooker. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is, as Ms. Uh, Stacy Ledbetter said, this is Gwendolyn Hooker, and I am happy um, to be on such a illustrious panel. And I am um, very honored to be sitting here to have it be included in the discussion that has definitely impacted um, so many, many residents of Kalamazoo, as well as myself personally. And as I am lending my lens um, as the CEO of Helping Other People Exceed, Hope Through Navigation, um, I am also standing up for the Northside residents who have been um, grossly and disproportionately impacted. So I am definitely very, very excited uh, to be having a long overdue conversation and I am grateful to lend um, my perception as an impacted person living in a community that's being um, devastated by the gun violence currently. Thank you so much. No, thank you. We appreciate you being here, definitely. And next, our vice mayor for the city of Kalamazoo, Latrice Griffin. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, let me apologize. Typically, I would have had my camera on for uh, conversation and such, but it just so happens that I'm doing a lot right now, but I'm very, very present. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yes, Patrice Griffin, lifelong Kalamazoo resident, uh, housing advocate, serving in several other capacities, uh, currently serving as the vice mayor of the city of Kalamazoo, uh, married to someone uh, at Genesis who's directly impacted. And over the course of this year, um, myself and my family have all become directly impacted and uh, lifelong, or excuse me, very proud Northside Kalamazoo resident um, as some of the other panelists. And I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to have you as well. And uh, Dr. Dixon, even though you opened us up and even though we have a majority of WMED students, we have other guests in the space. And so if you could just explain, please, uh, what you do at WMED and why we are even doing this. Why are we here? Why is WMED involved? So thank you. Uh, first, I do want to acknowledge um, my um, a partner for um, all of these things that we do is Dr. Donovan Roy. I don't think he's here, but um, he is the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. And so we partner on trying to uh, give um, different presentations or, or workshops um, for diversity and inclusion and really relating to um, having more of these conversations about um, things that are impacting the health of the community that we serve. And so um, my role as the Associate Dean for Health Equity and Community Affairs and as a practicing pediatrician as part of that is to care about this community and is to care about the residents and to understand what some of the things are, that are impacting them and to give that awareness to the uh, learners who are our medical students um, and our residents so that uh, we can begin, and because we need to be developing these partnerships and we need to be reduced in disparities. And the way to do that is to actually have these kind of conversations where we hear what is really happening, we understand, and we come together with what kinds of things we can do as residents and participants in this community to make change happen. And gun violence, you know, I know Commissioner Moore is gonna talk more about it, but it is a public health problem. Um, and it impacts us all. And, and my concern as a pediatrician is the families, you know, seeing the families and the impact that it has on kids 
Um, so um, that's trauma. And that's a lived trauma that impacts their health for the rest of their lives. And so we need to understand it. We need to uh, work together to come up with um, solutions because these presentations are meant to say, what are people doing? What are these different organizations doing to actually um, for us to learn from each other and also for us to say, what do we need? What's missing? And what do we need to come together to say that we need to advocate for to make a difference for resources to make it better? Thank you so much for that context. And for anyone I haven't had the privilege of being in the space with you like this, um, even though we've done a, a few of these with different topics, uh, my connection is I'm also a retired public safety officer, public safety captain, and um, currently working with Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Kalamazoo. So still dedicated to making our community a better place in terms of eradicating racism and discrimination, any hierarchy of human value. And when we deal with these things, such as the topic tonight in society, a lot of them have those connections to societal isms, if you will. And so um, we can only do better together. And that's what I'm committed to even in retirement. So we just want to um, set the landscape. We know the topic, but what can happen sometimes Particularly, I, I attended Western Michigan University also, not a Kalamazoo native, came from Detroit, so came to school and was just in that college world, oblivious to what was happening in the community, just focused on school, running home on the weekends, and not being tapped into the realities of people's lived experience. And that's what we want to make sure we lift and focus on, that anybody in this space just hears a story on the news, reads an article or whatever, but you don't have uh, the empathy behind it. These are real people with real situations, giving of their time, volunteering their time to share their testimonies, to share their stories, to share their expertise. So this is very, very serious. Um, and everybody here has showed up uh, committed to this purpose, but we also thank those of you are, who are here to learn, here to uh, grow and do more. And that's what we wanna do. So in that realm of, and um, it may come from one of uh, the commissioners or the vice mayor, if you could lay a foundation for us, for anybody, like I said, who may be oblivious and not tapped into the reality of the gun violence that the city of Kalamazoo is uh, dealing with right now. So either uh, Commissioner Williams or Vice Mayor Patrice, or one can go after the other. Can you all help us set that foundation to give our audience the reality of what's going on right now? So I think to try to sum it up is that not just nationally across the country, we're facing an issue of gun violence that continues to escalate in communities all across uh, the country. Uh, same goes for here in Michigan and especially uh, locally right here in Kalamazoo. And what we're seeing, Dr. Dixon, is an escalation. Um, from my perspective, what we have is a certain type of behavior. We have individuals who make bad choices, who for whatever reason do not value life, their own or the life of others. We have individuals who have not learned uh, either coping skills or even de-escalation. So when they feel threatened, when they feel um, disrespected, when they feel the need to, in our community, we say clap back at somebody, it's not your normal, okay, we're going to get into it, we're going to have a dispute, we might, you know, throw a few punches and be done with it. Now it has skipped over all of that, and it has resulted in the use of weapons uh, and gunfire. And uh, the behavior is, is so unchecked and so out of the way that Many of them have no experience at all handling weapons, uh, storing them or using them, uh, and let alone using them to target even an individual. We see over and over and over again where there are some gun uh, fire exchange, Vic Ledbetter, and they're not even hitting their target. They're not hitting the person intended, yet those bullets are flying in houses near children, the, the, the uh, aftermath is landing uh, right in the street in playgrounds. Uh, and so because now we got this, um, this careless 
behavior with unchecked levels of concern and there's no you know, uh, intention on preserving life, it, it's not just targeted as, oh, these are one person against the other, one group or one gang or whatever against the other. It's just all willy nilly, all out there and bullets are flying everywhere. For example, um, we have, I have so many residents, senior citizens. Uh, one, I'm at Mothers of Hope office right now, Dr. Dixon on Ada Street and my next door neighbor uh, who is uh, in her late seventies, she's on dialysis. And I was just at her house last week and she has 17 bullet holes in her house and four of them are right over her bed where she as an innocent victim has just been you know, privy to all of this violence. And where we were able to look, Vic, and capture some of the video of some of the things that were happening, you see folks out there shooting back and forth. They don't know how to aim, they don't know how to do nothing. But, and so it's just everywhere. So now it's, it's impacting every single person. And I heard someone say it earlier today, anytime you have a loss of life, that trauma uh, stays with people for a long time. A lot of people have a hard time getting through the stages of grief. And now uh, we have it where it's impacting families uh, because these shooters, these folks who are losing their lives and the ones who are taking their lives belong to families right here in Kalamazoo. Uh, and so now the ripple effect from the adults, especially down to the children. Uh, I was just talking to a gentleman last week who at the last count he gave me was over 20 children in Kalamazoo living without a parent due to gun violence. Uh, and that's just in the last year. That is devastating. That's almost uh, the number of children in a kindergarten classroom. And so I think we gotta really look at this issue and address it from a health perspective, mental health, substance abuse and substance abuse disorders. Uh, I'm willing to say, um, I'm not really a better, but I'm willing to say that pre pretty much every incidence of violence, particularly gun violence, is drug and alcohol related or induced, if you will. So we have to figure out how we provide support and health services, uh, recovery, and just a healthy space for people to address all of the issues that they're dealing with so that we can uh, expect them or encourage them to make better and healthier choices. And then we also got to deal with the economic perspective. You got some people that are out here on the streets because they just desire to have uh, money to be able to live, to, to everyday living. Like they're not trying to be millionaires. Some of them are just trying to take care of their family. Some of them are just trying to have shoes on their feet. I have a parent who came to my house a couple of months ago and she was telling me that her son who is uh, 12 and one is 14, that they often hold weapons for older adults in exchange for gym shoes. And she was saying they're so fascinated with Jays and Jordans and Nikes and all of that. And the older uh, folks who can afford that stuff, they know that. So they tell them, you stand on the block, you hold this weapon uh, for us and we'll buy you some gym shoes. And so she came to me, Stacy, and said, Stephanie, why don't we do a gun buyback and, and especially for the young kids, encourage them, tennis shoes, whatever it is that they're interested in. So I think that's only one small part of how we deal with this and handle this. I can tell you, and some of y'all probably gonna get upset for me saying this, that is not one program. Uh, what we're doing is we continue to develop these siloed, isolated, and even more offensive underfunded programs to say, this is what we're doing in this a community that is the most at risk, the most isolated, the most vulnerable, um, and, and, and hopefully something's going to come out of it. And then they do funding for 12 months, 18 months, and I'm going to be generous and I'm going to say two years, but usually that's not the case. And then they say, well, we funded it, so we don't know what did happen. Well, you're not going to turn back the ills of social violence due to extreme poverty for the most part of it in 12 months or two years. It's just not possible. And you got to address it from a holistic perspective. So you can't just have one agency, one organization, one person, and one 
section uh, of the community. It has to be inclusive. You got to bring the people at the table, especially those who are most impacted, who are living through, who are, are engaging in this behavior, who know the people who are engaging in this, in this behavior. And you got to offer the supports, the wraparounds, um, and all of that. So I want to tell you two things. I'm going to uh, close and kick it over to my sister, uh, our vice mayor, is that um, I'm working with a woman now who has a very, very close relative who has been a part of a shooting or some series of shootings. She's fed up. She don't want nothing to do with the individual. She's scared for herself and her children. But like I said, she's afraid. She doesn't have the, the security that she needs to come forward and say, I know this person did something. If I help y'all extract them from the community, can you help protect me? And then she's vulnerable because she's saying this is somebody who has also been a part of the finances in our household. So if I put him out, get him out or get away from him, I'm still not earning enough money, not making a living wage to be able to take care of me and my household. And even though she's willing to forego the financial part, she's saying there's a lot to go into me actually able to help address this one big piece that could help you know, with this whole issue. And so when I say it has to be fully funded, it has to be consistent, it has to have a holistic approach, um, and you gotta be able to put the supports on the ground immediately for folks uh, in our community. And I'm not saying tell them to call 211, that don't work. I'm not telling them to call 311 at four o'clock in the morning, that won't work. What we gotta have is, uh, is, is a structure already in place that can help these individuals who oftentimes, Dr. Dixon, are in crisis. They're in transition. They're in breakdown mode. They're trying to overcome substance abuse or mental health disorders and this and that. They're doing all they can, what they can, while they can, with no support. So that's what we really have to focus on. How do we get the community what it needs in a timely, consistent, fully funded, and ongoing and consistent manner? Thank you so Look, much. That was excellent. Go ahead, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. So just to add uh, just a little bit on to uh, what Sister Commissioner Stephanie Moore just lifted up. So, you know, gun violence um, has a ton of contributing factors. There's suicide, there's the improper usage of, of guns, there's domestic violence. Um, and then what we're seeing now in Kalamazoo is not too much different than what we're seeing across the country, which is an increase um, an increased amount of gun violence in particular neighborhoods, in particular communities, which go back to um, a system that has deprived these communities of many resources and such. And so now what we're seeing is a result of that. Um, and so you have many communities in need, um, many communities that are under-resourced, many communities that know how to um, address the problems within themselves, but are under-resourced and under-tapped into to be able to do so. And so from the city standpoint, um, it's, it's been really interesting because, you know, this is, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to take a systems change approach in order for there to be change for this. It's, the solutions for gun violence are going to come with dealing with the root causes um, and not some of the ways that, that gun violence has been addressed previously, which has led to mass incarceration, which has led to um, a perpetual state that we're seeing now. And so what I, what I think is really an important and, and one of the benefits, which is, I hate to call it a benefit, but, but being married to someone who is not only di directly impacted um, by gun violence, but a former perpetuator, being able to get that understanding of what's happening in our communities and why are our um, young men feeling unsafe and why are they turning to guns as a solution and, and really leaning into the community as a whole um, for those solutions. So again, it's a multi-layered, uh, multi-tiered problem, but I am happy that we're finally starting to get to a point where we can address the root causes so we can really have some real impacts in our communities. 
Absolutely. Thank you all. Between the two of you, again, uh, governmental leaders, and we appreciate your leadership. And so you're talking about uh, being holistic, understanding the why, dealing with root causes, being funded, being consistent, being supported, being on the ground. Uh, the fact that our community is under resourced and uh, again, leadership collectively, because no one individual, regardless of their title, as we know with the uh, the leaders in this space, it can't be done alone. And then the advocacy, so even WMU uh, medical students, and if we have other students or young people in the space, you have power. And so we wanna uh, wrap that into this conversation as well, you know, the things that you can do. So what we'll segue to now, and let me put um, this caveat in. Even though we have this space, it's been scheduled, we have a time frame. Uh, people have committed to show up and talk to you and share their stories. That word trauma is in the title. We have put it out there and it's not taken lightly. Sometimes um, it could be anything that, um, not that anyone ever loses a memory, but just brings up uh, a lot of emotion where it's difficult maybe in the moment to talk, to share or whatever. So I'm gonna tell all of our panelists or any of you in the space um, who have that, who have dealt with this issue personally with your loved ones, whether it be family, friends, whatever, uh, when you're called on, if now is not the time, please just let us know that and we'll keep going because I do wanna go into a space of testimony if you are willing uh, to share and so our audience can grasp from that perspective when it hits home, when you have to endure the things that people aren't thinking about when they're out there just do, perpetrating these types of, uh, of things. And so with that, um, Gwendolyn Hooker, why don't we go to you um, and whatever you're willing to share in terms of testimony personally dealing uh, with gun violence. Absolutely. Thank you so thank you so very much for uh, lending me the opportunity to at least give uh, my perspective and my personal experience as I have um, labored in love in this community for about 30 years uh, working in the nonprofit sector and um, giving of my time and my talents and my ability to be on the other end of um, gun violence is um, it's so many different emotions, I, I have to say, um, and it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, I lost a relative um, in July, Devante Coleman, to uh, gun violence, who was gunned down in the driveway of his sister's and, and grandmother's home. Um, that was in July. And then less than five weeks later, um, I lost um, another family member who is, is like a son to me, actually named after my own son, uh, Brandon Montclair Kelly, who was gunned down on Ada, shot eight times at point blank range in front of a home that is known for drug use, prostitution, uh, sex trafficking, and those types of things. And so as, we, as I look at what's happening right now in my community and, and starting to actually put faces and names to Many of the victims that we have that we have had to pay service to, um, at least since March, um, about 14 uh, individuals have been killed since um, in 2020 already. 80 something people, 86 gun um, shootings um, in impoverished neighborhoods who have already been impacted by traumas. Um, are now experiencing a catastrophic um, wave of events, which, you know, when we look at down the line, how this is gonna look, um, we're looking at if we don't do something now and actually employ all of the resources that we could possibly employ, um, the catastrophic results that we're gonna see um, 10, 15 years from now is gonna be devastating to this entire community from the education sector, health sector, Every sector of this community is going to be impacted if we don't figure out what we need to do and get it done. Um, I have to say that over time, um, the one of the questions that continue to come to my mind is, you know, not why me, you know, because I know that there's many, many uh, innocent victims that have been impacted by gun violence. Um, I just ask myself, what kind of community are am I living in that's creating these types of um, people that don't have enough 
um, resources and, and supports and services to actually address the root issues of why they feel like the best answer to the problem is to kill someone or to shoot a gun or to actually have to um, bury their loved one because somebody else made those decisions. So it's a lot of um, trauma personally, but also to this community. And I am an action oriented person. Many people that know me know that I, you know, I don't want to talk about the problem. We all know what the problem is. We have a problem with guns right now. Um, it's not a new problem, but it is new to Kalamazoo. Um, and I don't know, there's many, many questions. The first one is why is there so much easier access to, to guns? And then what are we doing as a community to start preventing and actually creating programs and initiatives to actually address uh, these people and find out what their core issues are so that we can actually get a, an, ahead of this as opposed to always playing catch up. Thank you so much. Thank you for that personal share. Definitely appreciate it. Um, Commissioner Tammy Ray, are you ready for the same? Or Doc, I saw you come off mute. Did you want to jump in at that point, Madania? Whenever, whenever you're, whenever the conversation allows. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're coming up. I was going to see if uh, Commissioner Elect Ray um, wants to offer her testimony at this time. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'll share briefly. Um, in 2006. Uh, I got a call probably at like six o'clock in the morning, maybe a little bit before. Um, I, I haven't forgot like early morning calls still trigger me to this day. Um, and it was my sister telling me that my brother had been shot and he passed away. So um, from there, which is, is one of the reasons why I do the work, but it also speaks to why it's important to address the root causes of gun violence. Um, he wasn't like some bad person. He was a great person. He was my brother, obviously. Um, my mother struggled with drug addiction. Um, she went through the criminal justice system many, many times. Um, they never looked at treating the disease. They always just locked her up, put her in boot camp, jail, prison, you name it. She went and we, we never, they never considered what was happening to these six kids while she was in prison. Um, so we went through the foster care system, just so many different things um, that brings me to the work, obviously, and then the need to support or address the root causes of gun violence. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what you shared um, was definitely a lot. And we appreciate that scope. Um, and folks tapping into both, you know, what you and Gwendolyn shared and, and you specifically saying how even an early morning phone, phone call. So for anybody who even has to call you and here you are now a commissioner elect. So I'm sure, you know, phone and everything else is going to be um, just on you. And so just people knowing that. So those of us who know can and respect that um, and acknowledge. So thank you for sharing uh, such personal information. Um, how about um, TC, we go to you with testimony and then we'll follow up uh, with uh, Dr. Medinia, which your perspective is what you're seeing when um, you know this unfortunate circumstance, people come to you the way that they do. So TC and then Dr. Medinia. Yes, I, um, I've just been sitting back, honestly, just listening. Uh, this is very powerful and moving and um, very in in influential to be a part of this panel from the aspect of, of the community. And I wish I knew where I can even jump in from other perspectives of where I have already been trying to add to this discussion. I have thrown um, ideas and concepts and now at the point where I have initially proposed a potential plan of um, action that we can kind of bite off from other police departments in other areas that could possibly help alleviate the gun violence. Um, I do want to send my condolences to um, those that have been affected personally in our city from gun violence. Um, I, however, am not from the Kalamazoo area. So personally, it's very hard for me to directly attach myself, but it hits us hard in the community because our children are growing up in this. And so I feel like I have been affected from it from a different standpoint. 
Um, I, I have a village mentality and I believe that I don't have to be related to you to, to make a difference and, and be a part of your life. So every time I hear them gunshots ring out, it sparks my heart and my, I just pause. So I do send my condolences to you guys. Um, and it, it's just sometimes hard for even for me to process it. And like I said, I just kind of got lost in the conversation because it brings back so many memories of growing up in the Detroit area because it was a norm for us, um, especially on the east side of Detroit. And I never thought that I would grow up or like become an adult and live in an area where it was not the norm anymore. And so I always try to think back, how did we get here? How, how it was never this bad in 2005 when I first arrived in Kalamazoo. So from 2005 to 2020, something has drastically shifted amongst our community and um, the, sorry, I was reading something, um, shifted from our community and, and to where we are now. And um, I just wish that the answers were easily accessible. I feel like as a former law enforcement um, career and driving myself now into a clinical mental health counseling and school counseling, I have shifted my mindset to a different standpoint. However, um, I feel like gun violence is always going to be one of those situations where it's very hard for any one person to control, let alone a community or a police agency. Um, unfortunately, people are going to do what they want to do. Um, but I feel like that there are some things in the city of Kalamazoo that we can do to sh help shift that mindset and that focus um, that, that entails, I don't, I don't know, trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. I just really wish I had the answers. And right now I am just completely speechless. I really don't even know what to say at this point other than the fact that I have just been extensively gathering data since October to now of shootings that have happened um, figuring out hot spots uh the south side i can tell you the clinton washington area is very detrimental um for the south side north side i've noticed a, a heavy trend with um rose street and there's another location but i can tell you i have recently gotten very lost in the data because of how current it's happening how frequently it's happening and I started researching other programs around uh, the world, not just in Michigan, um, just looking at programs at what their, you know, statistic data is when it comes to gun violence, uh, what type of programs that they're implementing to see if we can bite off of other programs and implement them here in the city of Kalamazoo. And one thing that I hate when I propose these types of ideas is that budget, the budget always comes into play. And to me, I feel like we're in such a resourceful, rich, resourceful area that the budget shouldn't even be an issue. Um, I feel like I have seen people pull through with ample amount of money for things that you would think gun violence wouldn't even be an issue at all. And those are the things that I'm always baffled about where I feel like I'm back at square one because people are so focused on the budget. Um, and so I just, I see some hands so I can pause for a minute. No, you're fine. Um, I'm just Dr. snapping because I totally agree with you. I'm amening you. Yeah, that was an amen. That was a uh, support and love. Support. Yeah. Got it, got it. Um, and so, you know, it's just sometimes it takes you back to square one. And um, I feel like we have to hit it in a business standpoint, I really think that um, the green light program from the, the Detroit area has been very successful since they started it. I do think that there are aspects of that green light program that we can bite off of and tweak it to where it's Kalamazoo's green light system, or it can be a different green light system. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I have started researching and looking into data for the last five years was how many times our gun shops have been robbed. The one that has been robbed most recently, I believe it was 48 guns. I, I don't remember, but there was a large amount of guns that were stolen from that same store. And that store has been robbed for at least seven times in the last five years. 
to me that that's detrimental that to me that shows mm -hmm. that there's a lack of security there there's a lack of um um, employment there to where that they can be able to uh, have maybe a 24 hour surveillance um, circulating that area. And so I think about what is it that we can do as a community to better um, equip our gun stores uh, with the surveillance that they need? Do we need to have officers in that area? Um, and so I, I think about things like that because to me, those are easy targets. And once people start picking up on the easy targets of seeing the trend in one particular gun shop being robbed, it's gonna continue to be an easy target. So I don't know where, you know, when it comes to the um, statistics of being able to like address it from the, the business standpoint into community because some of these gun shops are slightly on the edge of the Kalamazoo County um, area, but, I just, I, I tell you, research is going to be like the biggest aspect to piecing this together and bridging the barrier of ending gun violence in our city. Stace, can I say something real quick? Go ahead. And then uh, Dr. Medani, you'll go uh, after. Yeah, um, TC is right with the gun shop, but a lot of the guns that are on the street now are coming from private citizens and residents, residential. A lot of people living out in these rural areas who think that they are exempt for crime. These are the places that people who live in the inner city go to secure their weapons. I mean, we always get, when I ran the detective division, we always had houses that were broken into and weapons were stolen out the cars and other places. So it's not just a gun shop, it's people who not who want to have the Second Amendment not doing what they should properly with their weapons. I just wanted to add that. Absolutely. And 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 I think that that's the second part of the research that I was getting at, um, because they are able to track who's coming in there to, you know, get their, their weapons, um, you know, serviced or who's buying. Um, I've talked to some of these owners to see what their viewpoint is and how that, how can they help aid. And I think that, you know, um, there was a, message that was sent through in the chat and just talking about the underlying theme of the influence of drugs um, and what do leaders of our community think Oregon decriminalizing drugs. I think that this is something that, again, research shows that taking it, it I don't think it's going to be a barrier because we're already doing that. The reality of it is, I think when it comes down to um, you know, you're taking in a, pand a pandemic standpoint, you're taking in people losing their jobs, 853 million people just filed for unemployment. People are hungry and they see someone else eating, they're gonna go get and eat. And, and that's the best way that I can put it because I grew up in, in that environment where we wanna eat too. Um, and it's just, it's just unfortunate where, you know, coming from, like I said, the community standpoint of not really having all the answers, but trying to piece it together from that research standpoint, that's sometimes where I feel like I'm at my biggest hurdle and at a standstill to where I, I just tend to get stuck. Thank you, TC. We definitely appreciate uh, your input, which, you know, overlap into the solution area too. So thank you so much for that. Go ahead, Doc. Okay, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm an I'm associate clinical direct, uh, you know, instructor here at WMed. Who are my medical students? Are you guys on there? Are you all the um, muted micro microphones there? Andrew Gray, you already get honors. Congratulations for being on the video. That is how your clerkships are gonna go if you don't already know that. I don't know if you're first years or second years, but if participation matters. And uh, when you're involved in these discussions, you know, show your face maybe or say hey hey Rachel what's up how you doing like your Christmas tree um yeah so the you know I think that we remember I remember um being a medical student and um not really knowing much about gun violence and um you know I had got I had applied to medical school saying I wanted to help people I want to help people and I didn't know what that was all of us do volunteer we all think we're going to go into it and save the world and, um, you know, and you can, and you can make a difference. I'm not saying you can't, I'm not poo-pooing that, but you, you have to participate. And part of it is also 
being educated on who you are as a person, where you're coming from, what your biases are. And I think that these kinds of discussions are excellent. I think that, um, you know, I'll tell you some of my background here, and I'm sorry, Stacy um, Ledbetter, Miss Ledbetter, for if I take too much time, let me know. But um, my family is from Guatemala. I'm a Guatemalan, uh, I'm a descendant of Guatemalan immigrants. Uh, my mom and dad were both very, very poor, like think uh, dirt, dirt floor in their tin roof thatched house in Guatemala. And for somehow, by the grace of God, I don't even know how, my dad's father was an alcoholic, his brother and uh, was an alcoholic. My uncle Julio died of aspiration from, from alcoholism and my, my aunt just died of hepatitis, okay? So, you know, I have, I have a sister, I have a cousins who all have had babies that were at 15, 16 years old. And, and then for some reason, by the grace of God, I don't know how my dad ended up as a freaking neurosurgeon. Like who does that? I don't know, but that is my reality. Okay. I'm a child of a neurosurgeon, but, um, and you know, that was something else getting yelled at all the time, but you know, he's a good guy. The point is, is that I had this dichotomy of being like in these white upper-class schools where I was taught like people are making bad decisions and yada, yada. And then I had this whole other side uh, where, you know, my family was just trying to survive. My, my cousin, when I was an intern, as a surgical intern, I got a call that my cousin got a, a bullet in his head. And I'm, I don't know why. Uh, it doesn't really matter why. The point is that somebody decided that that, that was, that was going to be his, his um, fate. And, um, and that's what happened to him, you know, and I don't, I, I think of all of my patients as if he was my cousin, Daniel. I think of all of my alcoholic patients, all of my patients who are dealing with mental illness and drug abuse as my uncle Julio. If you have any sort of experience with that and hi, I'm Foniso, how are you? Put on your, put on your screen there, honey girl. And I see you there. Um, I think that, you know, you have to be able to have some connection to people who you are taking care of. And if you don't have a personal connection to that, to them, you make it, you make it during your medical school year. So congratulations for being here. This is excellent. And then you also do it when you're a resident. Um, other things that will come up is that you are going to be walking into this ivory tower. You're going to be in academia and um, your opinion matters. Your opinions matter. If you believe Black Lives Matter, you're going to wear a Black Lives Matter pin. You're going to say it. You're going to say hello to people. You're going to say hi to the housekeeper, to the environmental engineer. You're going to say hi to the janitor. Hi, Anthony. So, hi, honey. You're going to live. You're going to live that reality that you want the world to be a better place. And the first place to do that is to accept and acknowledge that systemic racism exists and that your patients are suffering. Um, and I'll never forget the first, and I don't, I don't know how surgery picked me, but it did. And I'm, and I'm honored that it did. Um, but in any specialty in pediatrics and family and orthopedic surgery and dermatology, you're going to have an opportunity to check your biases, check your biases, sorry, and also then bring that conversation within your community, within your group, with your partners who might not understand what, it, you know, why, why a patient came in the way they did. And I think one of the reasons why I might've been admitted, hi, Jesse, one of the reasons why I might've been admitted to this conversation and I'm honored to be a part of it, uh, Dr. Dixon, is that, um, you know, I made the, I, I, I talk about how sometimes in the trauma bay, you know, I'm a trauma surgeon. So airway, breathing, circulation, that's what we talk about to save a life. Okay. Airway, breathing, circulation. And sometimes people will insert really stupid things in the trauma bay. Oh, did you hear what he was doing? Did you hear that so-and-so tried to beat him? Someone, so he, he told on so-and-so that they were sleeping with their girlfriend, whatever the case may be. There's all this chit chat sometimes in the trauma bay and it's not exclusive to Kalamazoo. I've trained in Philly. I've trained in Baltimore. I've trained in Wilmington, Delaware, all the, it happens everywhere because we all have biases. Where is 
his mother. Ugh, what is this 13 year old doing with a gun? It doesn't matter at the time. At the time you wanna save a life, airway, breathing, circulation. That conversation gets, ex gets divorced from the trauma bay. But then later on, when you're thinking about discharging the patient or you're trying to figure out how you can keep that patient safe, you know who you ask? You ask the patient. You ask the patient, what do you need? And you might not know how to fix that problem, but at least you're offering to help. And these conversations with, uh, with uh, um, Mr. Ledbetter, Mrs. Ledbetter, you know, former commissioner, uh, Stephanie Williams, all these people are here to help you and they're here to help my patients. So when I have a patient saying, I gotta get out of Kalamazoo, somebody's trying to kill me. I had a beef, I had a beef with someone in high school I just graduated two years ago and they haven't let it down. I live with my grandmom and I live in a hotel and I don't know where else to go. That's what's happening. They're not, they're not decisions, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, and, I, and again, I'm not from Northside. They're not decisions that people are trying to make to kill people, to hurt people. A lot of these people have been victims themselves. Um, you know, just as, uh, Ms. as Ms. Ray said, and uh, Miss Gwendolyn Hooker, I took care of Devante. I took care of Brandon. I'm really sorry for your loss. Those are very difficult conversations to have with your family, and I'm really sorry that that happened. Sometimes you'll find as a pediatrician, as an internal medicine doc, as a family medicine doc, people are coming to you for asthma exacerbation. And they're living in a house where somebody is smoking or they have rats or they have cockroaches, whatever. You gotta get to, that's the root cause. That's the differential diagnosis and include that social history whenever you're presenting that patient. Get to know your social workers get to know your case managers. And if they don't know, introduce them to somebody in the community. Cause guess what? You probably already did volunteer work in the community. So uh, I'm sorry to go on a tantrum, but I, I think that, you know, if I, when I remember that we're speaking to WMED students, I think about where you are right now as a first, second, third year student and entering into the clinical world. And you're gonna hear stuff that's bonkers. You're gonna hear stuff that's like, whoa, I cannot believe that person just said that. Like like, uh, you know, inappropriate stuff that people are going to say. And you're going to remember, hopefully, this conversation I'm saying, and hopefully you'll check that person and you'll remind them of, of, of whatever, of their only human. They could have been your Uncle Julio, like in my case. Um, the other thing I'd say is as, a res as you progress to residency, you might want to consider finding a residency program that actually has an institute of diversity and has community connections, does a community health needs assessment. And let me tell you, I came from Wilmington, Delaware. Delaware, where our next president's gonna come from. Woo -woo. Sorry for anybody who's Trump. Uh, but he is, um, you know, but in Wilmington, Delaware, we had a real problem with gun violence. And, uh, and, and I got to know people in the community. And, and when I didn't know how to care for someone, I, I always called my, my equivalent of Ed Genesis. Um, and, you know, Mayor elect Patrice Griffin, you, you, you're, you know, I, I think he's a lucky man to have you, but you're also a lucky lady to, to be with him because he's, he's, a, he's a really super guy. And I, I love that he's one of my partners in crime over here, or partners in peace, I should say. So um, in any case, when, you're, when, I, when I was researching Bronson, where to come to Kalamazoo, Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be here in Kalamazoo, but I'm so happy, uh, you know, that Kalamazoo chose me uh, because the they, Bronson Methodist Hospital has a, an institute for diversity and they do community health needs assessment and they're committed to helping the community. And I think that this conversation of gun violence can't just be from me as a trauma surgeon, but also, but it has to come from Dr. Dixon as a pedi pediatrician 
and Mfoniso who wants to do uh, you know Eurogyne and uh, and specialize in, in, in women women's health. You know it's OBG people want to do OBGYN or Rachel. I don't know what you want to do, but you're here. You got a Christmas tree, so you know you're you're living the dream. And I think that you can help other people for sure. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Doc. That was awesome. And no, there was no. Uh, stopping you because again, you know, just you being able to speak directly to the audience and, you know, the predominant audience in terms of uh, our students in this space and what they have ahead in terms of their residency and you put it in, in that package and keeping it real, which I absolutely respect because like your field with Vic and I coming from law enforcement, same thing, keeping it real about the issues, about the disparities, about the roots that stem from slave patrols. And when people wonder why we have racial issues today and why systems are set up and do what they were designed to do. So it's not about anything to fix. It started off all wrong. It started off with discrepancies and disparities and racism and hierarchy of human value. We have to say it before we can yeah. even deal with it. And so many people are uncomfortable with even acknowledging the yeah. issue. So thank you for keeping it real. Um, that was wonderful to hear. And, and also uh, with our other panelists who have spoken, I know them better. So I know they have relationship and connection and everything you talked about. So, so to hear you call out names and know people and mention Ed Genesis and just have a well-rounded experience and uh, perspective, I respect you and commend you for that. So thank you for your share. And with that, uh, Director Ledbetter, if you could share, um, from that uh, investigatory perspective, your experience running a detective division and the vantage you had with dealing with these types of cases. Yes, ma'am. Um, the first thing I want y'all to understand, um, especially my med students, when y'all got to do a death notification, woo, there's no training for that. There's no, I, I can tell you to be compassionate. I can tell you to try to put, but that is the hardest thing that I had to do. Um, the well of a mother, when a mother just, when you got to tell that mother that her child is not coming back and you just see that audible and you just hear silence for like 10 seconds and then just that scream, that rocking. It's, uh, you can't console that. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can do except just hug them or just like, just be be in a room with them. That's the I think that's the best thing you could do. Just be there, let them go through what they need to do. Don't ask them are they okay. No, they're not okay. They, they're not gonna be. Their life has just turned around. Imagine somebody coming and telling you that your loved one is not coming back. Whatever it is, a car accident, shooting, or anything. So, like what Tammy said, every time that phone rings early in the morning for her, I understand that. Because when I ran the detective division, I had to sleep with my phone because I would get the phone calls one, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Hey, we just had a shooting. We just got such and such. Okay. I got to call my team in. I got to get up. I got to get dressed and I got to go in. I got to be briefed by the police officer or the first ones on the scene, what happened. And then I just got to have a, I mean, it's just, it got to the point I can do it in my sleep that we did it so much. And the biggest issue that I had was what Commissioner Stephanie talked about. People know who's doing it. We don't, police aren't that smart. It's just that the community, they know who, think, let, let's, let's do it this way. Let me give you a good example. When you were in high school, y'all know who sold weed, right? Y'all know who did all the bad, y'all knew all that stuff but y'all didn't tell. The parents, the security, the teachers, they didn't know, but you knew. So I say that to say that the people in the community, they know who's doing the shooting. But like uh, Sister Stephanie said, retaliation, I still gotta live there. I don't have anywhere to go. How are you gonna protect me? These are real concerns. And so let me tell you how we keep it real. The officers and detectives will always say, man, I hate the cold of the streets. I hate that they don't snitch. Why don't they just tell? Why don't they do that? These same officers, when the officer does something crazy and they got to get written up and investigated and they got to go to the turn affairs, these same officers who talked about the people on the street do the same thing in, inside that they do. They don't tell nothing. I'm like, hold up. What makes y'all different? 
They ain't like that from a brother. Because I, I, I call the truth. How can you talk about what somebody else is not doing and you put in that situation, turn around and do it? It's easy to sit there and judge somebody, but when you're in that chair, it's hard to do. I found it very frustrating. Um, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because I don't want to offend anybody because everybody's related. But I this one particular case um, happened at a club, club type thing. It had to be about 80, 90 pe 80 to 90 people in this space. Shots rang out. Someone got shot multiple times and was deceased right then and there. We get there, we have people come down to the police station. We talk to them. I talked to the uncle, listen to me, the uncle of the victim. The uncle saw his nephew get shot. Saw it, saw who did it. I'm sitting there like, hey man, who did it? I know you did it, F you, do your job. That's what he told me. I said, I am trying to do my job. He said, I'm not telling you. I said, hold up. Did you love your nephew? I did. I do. Who shot him? F you. I'm not telling you. Let that sink in for a second. You just saw your somebody you love get shot, and you're not helping me to help you. This is part of the ongoing saga. This is called retaliation. I'm going to I'm re, I'm represent my nephew. Now I'm going to go out and shoot their people. Then their people are gonna keep shooting. You, you see how the cycle goes? It's, it's, a, it's, it's horrible. So we have a lot of issues that we need to deal with. The first thing that we need to do, like um, <clears throat> Captain Stacy said before, we develop relationships in the community. I retired in 2017, it is 2020. I still get phone calls from community members asking for advice, giving me information because they don't wanna deal with the current police because they don't have those relationships. That means a lot to me developing those relationships. I have a lot of information, a lot of things I can do to help the police department, but they don't reach out to me. So I'm not, you understand what I'm saying? It's not incumbent upon me to reach out to them to help, but if they reach out to me, I'll give everything I had to make this easier. So from my perspective, there's a lot of work that we still need to do. We first thing you need to do is make sure that those who do give information are protected. Um, I've never, had a confidential informant burnt. Anybody who gave me sensitive information, I dropped the case before I had to tell on them. A lot of officers don't do that. They, they don't care. It's us against them. They come to the city, they clock in, they do their work and they go back out 30, 40 minutes away, country and, and their acreage and small towns and they don't deal with the people here. That's part of the issue. They don't, they don't have skin in the game, if you will. It's just a job. So until you get somebody who really cares, who really sees the trauma, who has to give those death notifications, who see, um, let, let me give you, a, let, me, let me break it down for you like this too. My family, my wife, my two sons, we were going to Detroit for Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. And this, you know, this never leaves me. I'm driving, we're going east on 94, westbound 94 up near, um, a couple of hours away, there was a bad accident, a, a fatality. And as we drove by, I was able to see the car and knew that there was a fatality because on the ground there was a, a body and the body was covered, but the arm was exposed. And my son, Darius, he saw that. To this day, he still remembered that, what the kid had. I mean, just that trauma, that PTSD. Our kids experience so much. To me, I, I, I just looked at it because I, you know, just like Doc, once you start dealing with death and all this stuff, I wouldn't say that you become um, cynical, but you you develop like a callous, like, you know, like when I slave, when our people ran away and their, their feet were all bad and had calluses and people said that was ugly. No, calluses actually protect you. They end up, you know, they help you. That's a hardcore. So I developed that so I can do my job, but my son, to this day, he still remember that. Dad, remember that day? I mean, so our kids are experiencing PTSD. There's more to it than just somebody getting shot. We got to see all the other things associated with it. But until we give people protection, make sure that they understand that the information you give to help us, to help you, that's going to be the biggest problem. Because I can tell you right now, everybody, I'm sure that there are many people 
who knows who's doing all the shooting, like Sister um, Stephanie said. But this lady, what does she do? She tell on this guy. Now he's gonna have people from the jail come and get her. She's not getting the money. I mean, you got to understand everything that goes along with it. So, um, I think I'm rambling at this point, but it's it's frustrating for me when people know who's doing it and won't say anything where I can help them. But yeah. Thank That's you, brother Ledbetter. I, and I see you step one sec. I just wanted to add just systemically you all, cause you flowed, you did a great job in terms of what you saw from your division. I just wanted to acknowledge that piece too, because we were both in a field, um, though we chose it, we were inserted into, and so we had to uphold what was there, but it's still the understanding that um, the lack of sharing and even in the community when people don't want to tell and I'm putting the retaliation aside, it's still systemic and lack of trust and lack of relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And so until that's there, um, you know, those uh, gaps won't be closed either. So obviously we have to pull a lot of different pieces, but that uh, lack of uh, tr uh, trust in terms of systems and, you know, sometimes leadership, et cetera, et cetera, we just have a whole lot to deal with. Go ahead, Commissioner Steph. Uh, Brother Ledbetter is absolutely on point. What I don't want is to people um, who are trying to engage in this work to think that, um, that the folks in the community who are most vulnerable exposed don't care. That's not true, they do. Uh, Vic really laid it out systemically. You've had some people that have come forward. Um, they've been exposed. Historically, we've seen how people, especially Black, Indigenous, people of color, have been treated by law enforcement. Those things don't just happen in Minneapolis and, uh, and uh, all those other places. It happens right here in Kalamazoo. And then you also got to look at um, our local police department, which, you know, I, I love KDPS. Um, but it's not, it's not always been representative where we had officers who looked like us, who lived and worshiped and worked and, and, and spent their money around us, those folks have exited the building. The Ledbetters, the, the Randolphs, the, uh, the James Ray, and all of those folks, those people who have deep rooted connections while they were in uniform and even afterwards, that's not there yet um, anymore uh, to, a, to a high degree. And so having trust, Having to be able to say, okay, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call and I'm going to tell what I need to tell. And being able to know that you're going to be uh, protected and supported. And I can also tell you that we have a lot of older folks, especially them grandmas. They First of all, they don't play. They don't play that. They're going to beat the hell out of their loved ones first and then call the police later. But you got some of them that's saying, look, I know my young person or even my adult person is caught up in all of this, but I want to help them. I want to help them get out of this and go on to whatever it is God has for them. And what they've seen historically is when they've reached out for help, their loved one has been mistreated, incarcerated, uh, exposed. Now he the snitch or she's the this and that or whatever. And so we got to really work on rebuilding those relationships and those and those bridges and establishing that trust. Absolutely, that we do a lot of you know good feel good things. We do clean up in the neighborhood, and you know we do this and that, and we might have a barbecue, and we might come out and dance and uh, do the cupid shuffle with the community, whatever. But we got to do a lot more. We got to change the systems, as Vice Mayor Preachy said. You got to look at the policies that allow uh, certain officers to expose people or make the decisions that they do to harass, to disrespect people. I had a guy call me not too long ago that uh, he had captured all of the information on this video. He was trying to talk to the officer and he was like, the officer was just off the chain. He was like, Stephanie, I'm not giving him nothing. So you, you can't train people to respect people. You can't train people to care about people. You have to bring on individuals that already have a heart of compassion and, and understanding. And you have to bring people that are anti-racism, that are intentional about being anti-racist, about being multi-culturally incompetent. You just can't know and try to understand the black community. We all are in this thing together. You gotta have people uh, who are fair when it comes to issues of equality. 
uh, regardless of, of, of how people uh, present or, or, or whatever, you got to respect them, them, their name, their pronouns, uh, their culture, their accent, their lack of, of, of not being able to have good grammar. You got to be able to come into a space that's safe and healthy and welcoming and be able to get what you need from people so that we can address in a real meaningful way. But that a big part of that starts at the local level uh, with local leaders really pinning policy, breaking down this structure. Because I can tell you, I've been at Kalamazoo County for several years. That, that is the most toxic place ever. I'm serious on a lot of different levels. I'm not just talking about at the sheriff department, but internally, it, it, the culture there. And so until you get to really getting rid of that and you start bringing in real tangible uh, forms of equity. Yeah, you can tell people to be nice to people and speak to folks, but hell, if you're gonna go to HR and not allow me to have a fair uh, access to the interviewing process, if I am the best qualified person for the job, but yet you won't hire me, if I'm trying to access services, which you know, my, me and my, ta my parents' tax dollars are providing, but yet I'm being blocked at every situation, I don't even want you to speak to me. Just do what you're supposed to do that's fair, that's equitable, that's inclusive, so that I can have a better quality of life. And we're a long way from that. Uh, right now in TC, uh, you probably said this before, we've done a lot of performative stuff. We, you know, we have the Black Lives Matter signs. We got flags flying off of our, our, off of our houses. You know, a lot of people show up and they chant and they protest. They go back to HR, they won't hire. They go back to financial institutions, they won't give loans or lines of credit. They go back to agencies and organizations and withhold resources that the community need and should have. They refuse to have conversations with people in the community that can give you insight and information, put you in touch with individuals. Um, and then the, the sometimes when they do, they totally blow it. They disrespect, uh, they expose, uh, and then they turn around and say, well, I, I was going to do it, but it didn't work. Well, you're the problem. And the system that continues to perpetuate that type of behavior and lack of concern uh, is a problem as well. So the root mm. cause is always where we have to start. And we got to be real with it. Um, we can't say that because there have been more shootings in the inner city, then it's the city, the inner city residents problem. When we have no resources, no connections to whoever to help us expose, extract, or or whatever, you, you can't just say it's us and not give us the tools, the resources, the means, and the support to be able to address the issue. But Stacy, what I can say is you have to empower the community to be able to do that. I'm not going to trust them next week, next month, and maybe not next year. But if I have what I can do to get it done, me and the village, we're going to come together and we're going to do support and love our folks through the trauma. And lastly, I'm going to say this, that PTSD is real, especially among our children. When we do the um, violence walks every year and we highlight uh, the lost lives and we celebrate their legacies and we just acknowledge their very existence. Vic, I can remember almost every last one of them who was shot down in the street, them bodies laid there for hours, sometimes all day long. We had school age children that got up, went to this, to this bus stop, walked over them bodies, seen their loved ones, their friends, mm -hmm. their family. That, that trauma is real. We've had individuals um, where we've seen them, you know, falling right in front of us. And even when Tammy talked about the phone call, like, uh, when we had five children that died in our community in a car wreck, mm -hmm. I got a phone call, I was on vacation, got a phone call from our deputy uh, sheriff. And he told me, he said, Stephanie, I hate to tell you this, um, but your children died in a car accident. And shit, I fell off the bed, hit my head. And I mean, it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. And by the time I got myself together, I'm like, well, Paul, what in the world happened and what's going on? And he told me about the fire and the explosion and this and that. And finally, Vic, I said, well, if there's really no remains, how you know they're my children? And he was like, no, no, no. I mean, they're your children from your community. I wanted to jump through the phone and kill him. <laughs> and you know? 
and every day mm -hmm. late night when I get them phone calls it's like oh my god you know my heart just sink mm -hmm. the anxiety go up it's just so can you imagine the parents who mm -hmm. have that call and what they that anxiety and then they go to work they stressed out and somebody systemic racism is there those microaggressions, and then they blow up. And the first mm -hmm. thing they do is they get fired or you got people at school and they're irritated and they can't learn. They're getting sent home and sent out. It all snowballs. And so you really got to deal with the effects and the long-term effects. Mm -hmm. You got to do that from a health perspective. And I know that a lot of you all that are here, Sandy, Cheryl, um, you guys can help us to do that and formulate um, those policies like health as uh, or as racism as a public health crisis, because we have to start there and help people with coping skills, uh, helping them to learn how to just breathe, to inhale and exhale without the fear of your breath being yeah. taken from you. You that can start so being helpful. So that they can you're invoking a lot of thought. I see hands. I see panelists coming off uh, mute, and I have another panelist to get to. So, uh, director, then Doc Metania, because I saw you come off mute, y'all too, and then I have somebody else to introduce to you all. So, when I was an officer, one time I, I stopped this car, and I knew everybody on the north side. <clears throat> this one gentleman in the back seat, he like let they said like Letty. That's what he called me, Letty. I got a burner on me. A burner is a, a gun that's serial number scratched off. I'm like, bro, why you got a gun on you? Where is it? He like in my back pocket, held his hands up. I went in there, got it. Sure enough, he had it. I read him his rights. I said, um, why do you have this gun on you? He quote said, I'd rather you, meaning the police, catch me with it than these people. He ain't said people, but you, you understand. They catch me without it. That's the mentality of some of the people that we did. I mean, again, I didn't grow up in the streets, but I understand the culture. So if you have an understanding, if you listen to rap music, if you listen to all this stuff, I used to tell some of my white brothers and sisters, y'all have to understand the language. You got to listen to some of this rap music to understand where people are coming from. Because if you didn't grow up that way, if you grew up with two parents, how can you deal with somebody who grew up living with grandma, if you never had a hand-me-down, if your idea of a hand-me-down is I got to use Mercedes, you don't know anything about clothes, how can you deal with that population? How can you deal with somebody running to school in the morning, you stop them just because they cross the street and now you hemming them up, I'm talking about the police, you don't know that this child's parent is on drugs, mother is doing sex acts to keep her habit and get stuff going on. This person is trying to go to school to eat and you hemming them up in the morning. So how do you develop those relationships? And my last thing for mad students, I'm gonna be real with you. When I say you need relationships, you need relationships. There were two cases when I ran the detective division with the suspects I knew. I made phone calls to the suspects' mothers. Black men called their mothers and their mother brought the suspect to me down at the police station. They told me if it wasn't you or Stacy, I wouldn't bring them. I ran the detective division. We had a shooting. I was told who the suspect did it. I called the mother and said, hey, the streets are saying your child did this. She like, yeah, I'm hearing that too. I said, look, we need him. He's considered armed and dangerous. She like, I'll bring him to you in 15 minutes. And they brought him down. That's what relationships can do. So when you have that patient that you're dealing with who's going through stuff, if you have a relationship, they're the ones that tell you they're getting molested. They're the ones that are telling you what's going on. Take the time to develop relationships with the people that you deal with and you don't know what you can unlock. Thank you, sir. Dr. Medania, you had come off. Did you have something specific in this flow? Um, well, uh, a couple things. One is that you, um, Commissioner Stephanie Williams said that children were running or walking over bodies and that, that really upset me to hear that. And it reminded me of something that the American College of Surgeons is working on. And so I just wanted to send an invitation out to any of the medical students to participate and any community members who want this program and it's called Stop the Bleed. And it's literally, um, it came out of the, um, it came out of the shootings in Sandy Hook where, hi Michael, it came out of the shootings of Sandy Hook where um, children were injured 
um, but they weren't so critically injured that they would have died from their injuries, but rather because they needed to lock down and secure the area, the children um, died from their wounds because of the amount of time that it took um, and the exsanguination that they experienced. Um, I'm sorry to be so morbid, but that's, that's what happened. So um, this also then happened again at the Bal in the Boston Marathon uh, bombings where it just so happened that the people that were running the marathon, uh, they were like nurses and doctors that were running in the Patriots day. And they all had training on how to apply a tourniquet, apply pressure, stop, literally stop bleeding. And as a consequence, many, um, many people's lives were saved. This is a nationwide effort by the American College of Surgeons to because because shooting is such an epidemic and and, and I'll I'll tell you guys that you know the, this is the um, Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery and we we talk about gun violence in it and one of the things we talk about there is stop the bleed which is essentially well you know if people are going to have such easy access to guns because of the Second Amendment um, then we should train what we call uh, initial responders, not first responders, but initial responders, the person who's standing next to you when they see that you've gotten shot, that they go to your, they go to your side. I implemented this program in Wilmington, Delaware, and it was actually interesting because a, a lot of people, a lot of people in the community were concerned that they would step on police, the, the, the police's uh, feet. They, they didn't want to disturb evidence. And you know, as a physician, it's just it's appalling that we talk about a patient who's been shot as a evidence. But uh, you know, Stacy's nodding her head, but that's how they think about it. I'm thinking about it as a patient, and you got to run quick to the side. And um, so it was this interesting interaction between talking to the community members about about how do you go to a patient's side and help them stop bleeding until paramedics can arrive or until you can, what we call scoop and run, where you literally stick them into your car and you take them to the ER. How do you do that and not antagonize the police who think that maybe you are disrupting the crime scene? And, you know, and I apologize, I don't remember his name, but he was, um, he was shot in a Wendy's drive through in Georgia. I, I apologize, I can't remember his name, but he was shot in the chest by police and no first aid was afforded to him. And, um, and he died there. And I, I am not saying our police are watching people die there, but sometimes the police and paramedics aren't at the, the bedside or at the side of the patient. And it's a real opportunity for us as uh, bystanders to apply pressure and stop bleeding. So um, that's something that Ed Genesis and I had talked about bringing to Kalamazoo. And I'm in need of bodies, specifically medical students who want to get trained and teach the community members how to do it. Um, so I leave that I leave that there. Please uh, email me later if, if you're interested because I'm going to get it started. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Ray. She put in the chat that that was Rayshard Brooks who was uh, killed in uh, Atlanta that you brought up, Doc. And just encouraging all of you to check out the chat. There's a lot of great comments coming through. I saw you also, TC and Doc, if you could put that book in the chat that you just showed, just in case everybody didn't catch the title, if they wanna look it up from them for themselves. I wanna introduce, and before I get to you, Dr. Dixon, to have you be um, the final word as far as the panel is in this segment, is uh, introduce you all to um, Mr. Rick O'Million, who also has a testimony, and I'll let him uh, share his story with you and you'll understand the perspective. Welcome, Rick. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to talk, but uh, Stacy asked me, and um, I am co-chair of the Isaac Gun Violence Prevention Task Force with Tammy Ray, um, and she and I have talked a lot about the trauma that both of, us, both of us have had in our lives um, with different experiences of what happened. Um, I'm also a member of Moms Demand Action, the Kalamazoo Group and Every Town Survivor Network. My daughter was murdered in, 21 years ago uh, in a domestic violence incident, uh, suicide, homicide, suicide. And uh, the effect of trauma, there have been several things that have been said tonight that have been difficult to deal with. And I, I, I'm not mad at anybody, but it just shows how long it lasts. It just, like Tammy said, it's, it's the way that 
things happen the way you heard about it and it just it's always there and, and i really appreciate all the discussions going on around kalamazoo right now the zoom discussions about about gun violence we have to do something the trauma involved in in what happens to the victims the perpetrators and all of their circle of family and friends and and i really think that that's i'm, a, I'm appreciative that that you've talked about it a lot everybody has mentioned it in these discussions tonight we really need to be aware of the long-term effects of trauma and getting resources to people um, who have not gotten them in the past when they've suffered trauma like this, the PTSD, the long-term effects of something that happened that they witnessed that happened to them um, or that they heard happen around them. I've heard a lot of discussion about, about young people in Kalamazoo being exposed to gunshots and the effect of that over time. And I'm just very concerned that we don't do something now, we're perpetuating the cycles of violence because we're not dealing with the trauma that somebody has and they wind up going forward in their life and they act out on that in some form or fashion. It's always inside of you. Um, it's difficult to know what to do with it. I've, I've talked to people, I've talked to Ed Genesis about, about getting trauma services and I was able to do it. My family was able to get help um, through victim services when this happened to our daughter. But we've heard about so many other people who don't get help, can't do it over time, can't access it like we did over time. And all the young people that come to school every day, I'm a retired teacher. And I never thought of it this way until it's happened to my daughter. There are those kids from those families coming to school and not being able to get the help that they need. I have a lot of concerns about that. I deeply appreciate the conversation tonight and all the conversations going on around Kalamazoo. This is really important stuff. Uh, if we can get help to people in trauma, we can stop this from going forward. Uh, we've got to do something now and we have to do something for the future. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. We thank you for, um, for that share. Uh, definitely, definitely heartfelt share. We appreciate you, Rick. Um, and keeping in mind another partner, you all, he mentioned Isaac, he mentioned the gun violence task force that him and Commissioner Ray are on. And a quick uh, response to this, Rick, if, because um, again, we're going to the tail end or the last piece of our discussion after Dr. Dixon will be about what can we do? We didn't want the students just here listening to all of this. We want to give them some action items. Our community members able to join a Isaac Gun Violence Task Force or do we have to give them other resources? You're on uh, mute, you're on mute. Okay. Um, yeah, we have meetings every but we've been having them pretty frequently lately, uh, talking through things and different issues that we've been addressing with uh, KDPS and, and uh, other law enforcement agencies around town. But we meet the last Friday, the fourth Tuesday of every month um, and talk about different things related to what's going on in town. Um, we're really focusing in on stuff on trauma right now. And um, so we can, there are lots of discussions going around in town. TRHT at Genesis has a lot of things going on. Michael Wilder with uh, the GBI, uh, the Group Violence Intervention, I believe that's is the correct terminology. They all need support of everybody in the community. So getting involved and in knowing about those things, um, joining some of the Facebook groups, TRHT, Isaac, uh, you'll get updates on things and what you can join in on. It's been difficult under COVID and people have had to pull back, but it doesn't stop the need and things have to happen. We have to do something. Absolutely, thank you for saying that. And we're gonna mention some of those things, but um, as I'm just listening to you and leaning on Candace and Dr. Dixon, because you all being the source for the participants in this space, us creating a resource list and you know things to do an action item so we can move on some things. Dr. Dixon, let me give it uh, to you before we proceed. Yes, yeah, so I, I actually been taking uh, notes. Uh, hopefully I can read my own notes, but basically um, 
I want to thank everybody for sharing their personal stories. I know that um, that takes a lot to do. And I want, I want to let you know that I'm sorry for your losses as well. And um, we appreciate your um, being able to share because I think it really helps to make it really real for us to really feel that impact and to understand. Um, from my point of view for, as a practitioner and what I do is one of the things I've been trying to bring awareness to is we don't even ask the questions, you know, right now in our practice, um, we, we see a lot of kids that have, um, for example, attention deficit or behavioral problems and they get quote unquote, you know, I put into these categories and um, we're not doing ACEs screenings, but we're not even asking the questions in recognition that this is a public health problem in Kalamazoo, that question of have, has your family or have that, you know, that child, have you, have you been a witness to gun violence or has that been something that's been in your family? Huge. I think it's that awareness coupled with, and that's the important uh, part about public health and understanding what's happening in your community and talking to the students and also talking to providers if, if there are providers on this. But that's, that's part of this is understanding and being aware of what's happening in your community to make you think about what else you may need to be doing to add to your practice. Because we are not just as Dr. Medinez uh, has so you know, beautifully and you know, every time she speaks it just touches me because it touches to the heart of what we're here for. So we are here for care and that we all got into this to care and because we care and we wanna take care of, but we can't get lost in that we are just here to do the mechanical piece of what we've been taught to do in medicine. We are part of this community. We need to know what's happening. And these are people that are being impacted beyond what we're seeing. And if we're not asking those questions and particularly with kids and families, uh, my, one of my charges is to, make, to actually get us all to start asking those questions in peds. Um, Andrew, we had a conversation um, earlier and one of those uh, conversations was uh, in the checklist, are we even asking, I said, you really should be getting that training that are you asking, are there guns in the household? Because the other thing is, uh, you know, I'm from Newark, New Jersey, Star New Jersey, and like I said, gun violence is everywhere. And so it was also part of where I was. Right, and so part of it also is gun safety. Um, you know, um, guns in the household and accidental uh, shootings that happen to kids because they pick up the guns, the safeties aren't on, they're not locked up. And I cannot tell you how many kids in, in Newark that I saw that actually were, um, that happened. And so asking that question, do you have guns in the house and do you have a safety on them and, are, and is it in a place where kids are not able to get to? Um, those questions need to be, you need to be being taught to ask those questions and we all need to be asking those questions for just that safety piece. And the other is asking the question of, you know, there's a lot going on in the neighborhood, you know, hearing about this, have you or your family um, been personally affected by this or your children? And it's, it's a simple ask. And then from that, then you can begin to say, I'm not going to just treat you for your vaccines or that what you need, what you're here for. I need to then let's have a conversation about that or then make resources. You know, we have integrated behavioral health services where I am, but really to be able to connect because ACEs are trauma and that trauma that you carry from youth on and, and even as an adult, it has to be something that you can talk about that you can get some healing from. And, and, and in order for that to happen, we need to be able to um, ask that question, be partners with you in that, and then actually uh, provide those resources for you. So Dr. that's where I'm coming you from, mind, yes. You wouldn't mind just telling the medical students what ACEs stands for? Oh yeah, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, that is now part of you all's um, instruction. Um, and Adverse Childhood Experiences very quickly uh, it's just an item checklist of different, you know, categories. It's like a 10, you know, you get a score. And depending on how high your score is, it's, it's risk, risk, uh, risk factors based on physical neglect, um, whether or not you were, uh, you know, have a parent or somebody that was in incarceration, foster care, different things. 
um, the higher your score is the, the more likely, and it's actually a, a dose response um, curve, that you will have certain illnesses as an adult, like obesity and addictions and uh, other things that happen. Um, hey, Doc. So anyway, yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw the chat, but I have ACEs taught in the police academy. Okay. Because the officers understand that we all deal with trauma differently. And if they come up to talk to a young black male, for instance, and he runs, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's guilty. Mm -hmm. That's just a way of him dealing with the trauma that he is experiencing in his, experience in his life. So um, ACEs is, um, we all have been affected by trauma. Um, I took the test, the little sheet, and I was surprised at the number that I had when I was like, wow, but we, we have a way of dealing with things. If you ever get a chance to take a course, ACEs, I recommend that you do it. It is very eye-opening. Yes, yes. And actually, you know, we can't just isolate just at ACEs. The other part of that is resiliency. So we also look at your resilience because people can have high, high A scores and be resilient. You'd be able to cope and really, you know, um, do well. But anyway, so understanding that, you know, um, those are questions that need to be asked and not just ask the questions but to act, to provide some resources for care after, you know, just like this conference, um, what we're doing in this conversation is we hope to also, uh, I'm going to stop talking, get to what can we do, right? You know, what can we do in the county level, you know, with looking at root causes, what, what's being done and what can be done? Um, what, what can we do better in medical, you know, check our biases, I really think it's important that because our biases do impact the way we treat our patients and how we think about them, um, and particularly trauma victims. Um, that's why I was like so happy that Dr. Medanina came because it really is important that you see that person and, and not just that person, the family. That person has a family and that family needs to actually have some care. There are programs that, that do, you know, that, that are um, in, in hospitals. There's one in Detroit called DLive. But there are programs. Um, Dr. Medania talked about Stop the Bleed. Uh, and then there's advocacy. You know, what kinds of things can we do as advocacy? So I'm going to stop talking because I think that um, I would like us to now just talk, leave with what's being done and what can we be and what can we do um, in all three of those areas, like on the county level, medical level, advocacy level. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dixon. That was the perfect segue and you actually started the pack. So what I'll do is call on each slated panelist for you to do just that. Give us a, what can we do? What can the community do? Government officials, what works in terms of advocacy, pushing governmental leaders to make change or listen to the community, even when it may be different from what they think should be done. So please watch your clocks. Uh, we're moving this time, always go fast so please do not take over two minutes a piece I'll give you a little wave or use the reaction um, if you're going over just so everyone can lend their voice so let's start with uh, Commissioner-elect Tammy Ray. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of things that we can do some of us are already doing some things um, the first thing that I would say though is listen to the community um, a lot of times community feedback is ignored um, I also want folks to understand that three or four people do not represent the entire community. So we want to make sure we're moving away from those token people who are easy to talk to um, and have those conversations with everybody in the community. Um, also, I think it's important for organizations to share information. Um, I think Commissioner Moore lifted up that a lot of folks are working in silos. Um, I think it's important that we create some type of database where the data is coming in real time so that we can use that for strategic planning purposes. Um, I also think it's important for public safety to hire people who are from the community. Um, as Vic looked it up, a lot of times the public safety officers, they're not from here, they don't care. They talk to you like they don't care and then they ask you for your help. Um, but it's important that we tap into the community when we're looking at solutions that we're not increasing police presence um, we are talking to the community. So it's important for that relationship to be there with public safety so that the community trusts public safety and that the community feels safe. Like we trust the police officers, we can feel safe. 
we don't have to carry our guns because we don't want to get caught without it. So um, those are some things. Um, we have formed like a coalition of folks who are already doing the work to talk about policy change, um, to, to talk about things that the city and the county can do because we think it's important to invest in our communities. Um, so we're just having those conversations together. Um, we're looking at what resources we already have and where we can tap into more to address the root causes and the social determinants of health as those things are all important if we're gonna talk about long-term solutions as opposed to, to things that are just happening today. So I'll stop there and let somebody else ask some solutions. Um, so we're not all saying the same thing. Thank you. And what we'll do as I call on you all, if you all have, I'm talking to panelists now, any websites, books, information, I'll also put it in the chat, but we'll also, you know, lift your voice just as well. Vice Mayor Griffin, are you uh, ready? Let's go to Sister Hooker. Gwendolyn Hooker, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, myself, I'm gonna try to um fast line this into the two minutes allotted to me. Um, but I definitely want to uplift, you know, the work that we, uh, Tammy Ray spoke on it briefly, that we have been doing as a community of grassroots organizers that do work in respective organizations, but have been doing this work um, in response to the gun violence since June. And we are um, definitely trying to mobilize people to really raise awareness about the issues of gun violence. Um, I don't think that the community as a whole really recognizes the impact that has that the gun violence is having on our communities. Um, when we look at the statistics um, that show that all of these gun violence, all of these shootings are happening in impoverished neighborhoods that are already impacted by trauma. We're talking about the north side, south side, east side. There have been a few um, on the outer layers of the community, but for the most part, these shootings are happening in neighborhoods that are already distressed distressed and impacted by so much already therefore the need for um real-time resources on the ground right now um we are responding in ways right now specifically to the 14 families that we know have been impacted uh, recently to the gun violence by providing whatever services that each one of our entities are able to provide um i think it's really really important for folks to receive um um racial-based trauma therapy by uh, folks that look like them and have the same lived experiences that, as them. One of those um, collectives that I will lift up that we are, uh, Hope the Navigation is a part of, is the Brown, the Black and Brown Therapy Collective, which just rolled out uh, this week, um, which offers racial, racial um, therapy based on folks who are from the community that look like the community people that they're serving also want to talk about a database that um, we are working with through the Defender's Office and the TRHT Law Design Team of actually, you know, getting resources available so that there is a database available, um, that it's actually a transparent mechanism that anybody can access to know exactly the arrest records, what the demographics of the people that are being arrested, what, what are the outcomes of these arrests, all of these kinds of things are really the social determinants that really feed off of why we're in the predicament that we're in right now. Um, really wanna lift up the fact that we need emergency response teams on the ground right now. Um, I was you know, happy to, to be at the city commission meeting via Zoom uh, when Vice Mayor uh, Commissioner Hess and, and Mayor Anderson um, kind of unveiled $100,000 that was available for gun violence um, initiatives. Um, that is a drop in the bucket for what we need. We are playing catch up at this point. So right now we need to strategize and mobilize dollars and people to actually not only raise awareness about what's going on, but also to talk about what we can do right now for the folks that are being directly impacted. I said earlier, there's been at least 86 shootings Mm -hmm. That's at least 86 separate families that are dealing with some type of gun violence or some type of shooting that has been um, affecting not only them, but overall will affect this community as a whole. So definitely want um, 
to talk about the solutions. Definitely reach out to myself, Tammy Ray, Vice Mayor. Um, we've heard uh, Ed Genesis' name mentioned several times. He's also part of the coalition and is doing awesome work. So there's people that have been doing the work. Um, I think it's important to really look towards the people that have been on the ground doing this work and know and have relationships with people so that we can actually be impactful and transformative in the lives of, of the people overall. Thank you so Thank much you. for um, allowing me to share. Thank you, appreciate you. Uh, TC, are you ready? I'm not quite ready, but I, I can go ahead and, and do what I got because I feel like there's some some important information going on. So I'm, I'm just going to approach it from the standpoint of what my vision is and what it is that I've been doing in the community as far as being um, a part of a youth organization. So I feel like first and foremost, when it comes to a community standpoint, I feel like we have to go in assuming positive intent. And I think that that is going to be a part of our biggest solution. I think that amongst that, we have to learn to collaborate with others with the positive intent of not passing biases, nor coming from a competitive notion. I think that sometimes that competitive factor uh, divides us even farther because there is um, a lack of understanding of one's viewpoint and or wanting to bridge those gaps and coming together um, from the community standpoint of organizers, activists, or even community leaders. I think that with that said, we have to also not only see the other viewpoints, but also try to understand that their missions and see where we can fit others in with the overall good, um, assuming those positive intents. I think that we need to create resources and outlets for our youth to deter them from wanting to join these negative entities that are taking part in gun violence despite pandemic issues. I do know that there were a lot of programs that were canceled throughout the entire year. Um, because of social distancing and the pandemic, which allowed our children to become bored throughout um, not only this past summer, but also throughout the current year. And I have seen children fall victim to joining these particular um, scenarios. I have had conversations with uh, individuals that are a part of the gun violence and feel that the only way out is to kill each other. So sometimes it's hard to even shift those mindsets. So I wish that there was more that we can do from the standpoint of reaching out to those that we know are doing it and be able to level down and come up with something from that. Um, I think that we just got to figure out how to bridge the gaps from the community standpoint and local leaders without um, being offended. Constructive criticism is going to be um, a big plus for us, and I think that we have to be able to accept it, take it, and be able to give it as well in order for us to really collaboratively work together from any standpoint, and I'm going to end it on that note. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Medania? Okay, thank you. Um, when I was a fourth year medical student and I wanted to go into family medicine, I was in my trauma rotation, and I saw a uh, 20 year old guy who came in who was shot multiple times and lost pulses in the trauma bay. My chief resident without a hesitation opened up his chest, per performed cardiac massage and got him to the operating room and he, he, he lived. Some of the comments that surround what we call an ED thoracotomy revolve around the safety of the procedure and the fact that it has low success rates. Ergo, why are you gonna do a procedure that has a low success rate when you could actually be hurting your team? What do I mean by hurting your team? I mean a needle stick, a knife stick. It's a very chaotic experience. The ribs are jagged, you stick your hand on it, you get exposed to HIV, hepatitis, etc. This is a racist, in my opinion, this is a racist uh, reason not to do that. I think when you're faced with life and death decisions, you're going to do everything you possibly can to give some sort of outcome for that patient. These are the types of conversations that come up in, in something as, as not touchy feely as surgery. And so it's really incumbent upon you as a medical student and as a professional to identify all of those dog whistles. Just like you have dog whistles in politics, you have dog whistles in surgery as well. 
And um, that happens in all specialties, but surgery uh, is, is not, uh, not immune to it. And so as a, my last words would be to please just keep your, just keep your senses up and learn about your own implicit biases. Read, 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 read. And when faced with those kinds of comments, you, you, you say something and you be brave enough to say something at the time. Beautiful, thank you. Um, to wind us down, we'll have uh, Commissioner Williams and round out with Director Ledbetter. So y'all y'all used to work in each other. Y'all see the time? Y'all go on and share it so we can end on time. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we all know that Kalamazoo County is the hub for health and human services and all of those health things flow through Kalamazoo County. We also know, uh, Andrew Gray, that Kalamazoo County, even though it is over all of the local municipalities, the city, the townships, and all that good stuff, is the only local body that does not have diversity and inclusion department. It does not have equity in any of its policies and procedures. Uh, and it also is lacking drastically in diversity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and, 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 and that means race and gender, basically. So I got a couple of recommendations from there. She's on this call and she has no idea I'm gonna say this, but the first thing you all should do, if you personally know Tammy Ray, you should write her, text her and email her and encourage her to seek the leadership for Kalamazoo County Board of Commissioners to become the next board chair in January. Because if we're going to navigate any of this, get this work done, leadership matters. You need somebody in that chair seat that has the experience the lived experience, the training, the wherewithal, and on the ground that when they're pinning the policy to vote on, they understand how the policy will impact the people. So not just you contacting, we should be having everybody contact this new board of commissioners and telling them they need to elect Tammy Ray to be the chair of the Kalamazoo County Board of Commissioners. The leadership is elected by the sitting board. Um, there are two people that can truly serve in that capacity. That's Tammy Ray, that's Veronica McKissick. Um, and so I, my, my money's on Tammy. Also, uh, what we can do is we can also tell this incoming board to do the work. Uh, we have already done all the groundwork for diversity, for equity and inclusion and all of that. The policy is already there. Uh, they need to execute in a very timely manner and to get that done. Also, what you can do is the funding piece. We talked about how we need to have adequate funding, but Stacy, we need to really take a deep dive and look at the black led nonprofit organizations, grassroot and grass seed in the community and look at their funding. All of them are not adequately funded. They don't have capacity building grants, and yet they're on the ground hustling and bustling any means necessary to get the work done. So local philanthropy, we need to have the conversation about, about adequately funding uh, those organizations to build capacity and to be able to do outreach. And I know Gwen Hooker is probably saying amen right now. We want to thank the city of Kalamazoo for $100,000, uh, but Gwen Hooker hit it on the nails. That's a drop in the bucket. We got to do better. Your wallet should show how much our Black lives matter. So turn it up, level up. We need less free. We give, give, give people all kinds of stuff. What we need to do is give them access to opportunities to employment, to earn a living wage for youth in, uh, employment and not just the summer, but all year round. And we have to economically divest and invest in small businesses, small black owned businesses. We got black Wall Street Kalamazoo. You can get any and everything you need, but people need employment. They need living wage. They need benefits, paid leave so that they can do the work that we need them to do. Um, and lastly, we need to have a countywide anti-racism training for, for, for community members, for residents, for families, for grandmas, and people we consider to be local leaders. Just because somebody black don't mean they're not racist. We need anti-racism all the way across the board in everything that we do. Thank you all. Thank you. We're on seven directors, so it's still seven. Go ahead and close us out. Um, I think it's all about racism. Um, if you if this was happening in Bronson Boulevard, do you think that this wouldn't be addressed quickly and succinctly? 
Think about what happened with opioids. When the white kids got on it, what happened? They decriminalized, they threw money at it, and they called it a social or a health issue, and they treated it differently. So I think that racism has a part to do with that. To invest in our children, instead of putting money into the juvenile home, we need to put money into youth centers and mentorship. And like Stephanie said, give these kids jobs and hope. Our people need hope. They have no hope. They, they're trying to eat and they're trying to make it. So this can be won, this can be combated, but we have to have a real honest conversation just like we just did. So I'm ready to work. Awesome, thank you. We did it, you all. Actually, you all were patient, so we appreciate it. This conversation continues, these collaborations continue. And like we said, there's many people out there uh, connected with other people doing the same work. So we eventually all want to come together. We could have had easily 20, 20 panelists. And so for all of the, you who gave of your time and your expertise, your heartfelt shares, your uh, experience and your testimonies, we appreciate you so much. And we look forward to the conversation and the action, which was very specific uh, to continue. So Doc Dixon, can we get a list for the students to get these action items? I've been taking notes, we've been recording yes. to give them some I, stuff to move on. I think that's important. I think a lot, a lot of stuff was mentioned. So if everyone would also share like the task force, you know, so the students can be aware of the task force and at times if there's, that they can actually attend those meetings if they can. Um, you know, what kinds of programs that are, we can actually begin to actually start doing like the um, Stop the Bleed, you know, um, there's in the chat things that we actually are involved with education of um, the young kids in the community and our pathway programs, you know, we can start act, you know, adding to those programs about um, gun safety and, and just talking about the violence and being able to hear their, you know, what, what they're seeing. And so there's so many different things. So um, I think that uh, the other piece is understanding about how important advocacy is that, you know, the vote, like, like uh, Commissioner Moore said, you know, you all can vote, you know, and actually write letters, you know, there is power in the pen. I think I wrote that, but there's power in the pen uh, to be able to write to the county commissioners to say, this is what we need. I mean, TC has done, what we call tracings. So she's done tracings for public health. You do tracings of when you find that there's a problem. She's actually done a, a tracing in the community of when she's talking about where the pockets are for gun violence. Then it's like that's data that needs to be taken to the county to say, there needs to be more lights, street lights. There needs to be more police pro, uh, patrols in those areas. Whatever those things do because of those tracings, there's something that can be done for that. And so that advocacy for um, saying, you know, let's do something about that. I think, you know, going forward, I do think we can pull together